joining our weekly podcast recording uh, for Transformation Ground Control. It's a weekly podcast we publish each week that covers all things related to digital transformations, including the people, process, and technology uh, sides of transformation. So thank you for being here today. Uh, today's topic is lifting the curtain of enterprise technology sales. Um, we're going to dive into and bring on a guest. I have a guest here with me that I'll introduce in a moment. That's going to help us unpack and understand the psyche of sales reps. So if you're a salesperson or if you're buying from sales reps in the enterprise technology space, the whole idea here is to uh, really understand uh, how sales works and uh, what you should know, either as a sales professional or someone who's buying from um, a sales professional, especially if you're making a large multi-million dollar purchase. Uh, we'll talk about some negotiation tactics and things of that nature uh, as it relates to that. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm the CEO of Third Stage Consulting. Uh, we're an independent consulting firm that helps clients with their digital transformations. We help with digital strategy, software selection, and implementation of various technologies. So uh, you can learn more about us at thirdstage-consulting.com. And of course, I'm the host of the weekly podcast called Transformation Ground Control. By being here today, you're part of the live production of the podcast. So thanks for being here. And uh, we're going to take questions from the audience too. So if you've got questions or comments, Along the way, please feel free to drop those in the chat here, wherever you're uh, joining from today on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter. Um, and also, um, speaking of the chat, if you don't mind, in the meantime, before we start getting into some questions for our guests and before I introduce our guests, if you don't mind just dropping in the chat where in the world you're joining from, what city and country are you joining from here today? Um, we typically draw in a global community, so it's always great to see where, where people are joining from. Um, so I'd love to hear what city and country you're from today, and I'd also love to hear if you're in sales or if you're involved with buying from a sales rep, I'd just love to hear sort of the perspective of where you're coming at this conversation from here today, um, because we're going to cover both angles. Like I said, we're going to cover the angle of the sales reps and just how to sell more successfully. But we also want to talk about and talk to people that are perhaps negotiating large enterprise technology or services types of solutions with a sales rep and just understanding how to be more effective uh, in those conversations. So love to hear from the audience here, uh, what, uh, what sort of your role is in the sales world. So uh, while you're dropping in the chat, what city and country you're from and what your role is within the sales world, I'd love to introduce our guest, who's a first time guest on this podcast, uh, James Roloff. So James, thanks for being here today. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, likewise, thanks for, for being here. And uh, tell us a little bit about you, your background, and also uh, your company, Roloff Consulting, if you don't mind. Yeah, so I'm James Roloff. Um, I've been in the, I'd say the, the online business space since 2001. Um, I was young then, uh, I'm not that old. Um, but I built my first website back then. Uh, I've been doing web development and programming. Um, and then more recently, moving more into digital marketing, digital sales in the last decade. So uh, for the last decade, um, I spent my time leading a sales team at a web development firm, web application firm. Um, and then we sold that business in 2021. And then now for the last two years, I've been in roll off consulting. So we've been training and teaching uh, sales reps and sales teams and business owners on how to leverage digital sales uh, strategies to grow their business and kind of execute that sales strategy. Right. Right. So it's a, uh, you, you sort of, you've covered a lot within the world of sales and marketing and e-commerce and digital marketing, all that good stuff. It sounds like. Yes. Yeah. A lot of interaction with different sales teams. Um, you know, a lot of teaching people how to leverage things like LinkedIn lives and YouTube, uh, to get more successful with their sales strategy. Interesting. Yeah. I'll, I'll be curious to ask you a little more on, on maybe the social media side here in a minute, but just to, to start, maybe just to help us set the context, what can you, can you start off by giving us an overview of enterprise technology sales? And this is maybe more from the perspective of those of us that want to move into sales, perhaps we're already in sales, looking to further our careers, or if we're a potential enterprise buyer, you know, what, what is it like, tell, what can you tell us if you were just to summarize or give us sort of an intro to enterprise tech sales, what the different roles are and that sort of thing. Yeah. So that the line or the definition of what is enterprise sales is a little bit blurry depending on what organization you're in um, and what you're selling. Uh, but typically when you say enterprise, you're talking about 500 person plus organizations from employee standpoint. Um, or you break it down by deal size. So maybe it's like $250,000 plus in value. Um, again, you can have totally different values based on the size of the company and the, and the software you're selling to. Um, and 
typically enterprise sales are longer from a sales cycle standpoint. So you're talking about like 12 plus months of time from initial contact to close a lot of times. Uh, but again, there's this huge like kind of gray area of in between where it's like in between small and medium business to enterprise sales. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's probably more helpful to think it in more of terms of just the scope of how big of that transformation the project is. Um, because if you were, you know, replacing a major part of an enterprise's software or process um, and, and the dollar value is higher, that tends to lead to more of that enterprise type sales. So that's typically how I like to look at enterprise sales is more of just like, what are you actually doing and how big is that actual deal size? Gotcha. Okay. So there's um, sales reps that specialize in the larger, call it, you know, 250 K of value plus or 500 employees plus or whatever the criteria in an organization or a software company might use to define uh, enterprise sales. But, it, but it, there's also, are there segments below that, like maybe non-enterprise sales that are selling to small and mid-sized companies as well? Yeah, exactly. There's kind of that small to medium-sized business sale. Um, and you bring up a great point that it's a different skill set from a rep and it's different activities involved for enterprise sales than there are for small to medium-sized sales. Because a lot of times for small to medium-sized sales, you're talking about you know a shorter sales cycle it's more activity based of i won't say churn and burn but it's kind of more of a, a set process you're moving somebody through where enterprise sales is a lot more about understanding the business a lot deeper bringing in different key stakeholders building that relationship and then kind of custom tailoring what you're doing based on that enterprise's need um, where again that small to medium-sized business is much more of like a traditional sales type role so i think yeah, it's a really important kind of framing to know that it's a different skill set and different activities involved in enterprise sales versus that small to medium sized business sales. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. So, are there um, are there certain? Well, before I ask you that question, let me back up a little bit. But what are the different um, when you look at sales? It's not you know, especially if you're selling larger solutions like multi-million dollar solutions or if you're a buyer that's buying from a sales team typically it's not just one salesperson you've got multiple people that are involved in a sales pursuit so like yep. if i work for a big fortune 500 company and i want to buy some erp software or erm software or whatever some big software purchase and services to go along with that i'm probably dealing with a team rather than one person like how are what are some of the major roles though within a sales team that, that i might interact with or if I'm going to be a salesperson, you know, what are the different roles I should be aware of uh, on a sales team? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think the best analogy I've heard is kind of like a football team. Um, and so your account rep, if you are the, the main rep on an account, you're kind of like the quarterback um, of this kind of, you know, calling out the plays as they're happening um, and, and making people do their thing. Um, but you also have people above you. So you have like your executives that are maybe moving the deal forward from different perspectives or negotiating with software vendors and so software, software partners to get discounts on behalf of the client. Um, and I'll see any kind of concessions they can make from a, a firm standpoint. Now, a lot of times too, you have people lower from the total pull <laughs> from a sales perspective. So think like BDRs um, or marketing support staff, they're helping to bring in leads. That might be that first point of contact for a lot of people. If you reach out to a vendor or an implementer, you might talk to someone on that BDR team or that marketing team first, and then get pushed into a sales rep after the fact. And then beyond that too, you know, for enterprise sales, a lot of times you're bringing in people from the operation side of a business. Um, so consultants or process experts that might be involved um, as part of the implementation, but bringing them on earlier on in the process uh, so they can correctly scope things out and make sure that from a technical perspective, all the needs are being met of the client too. So there's a lot of moving parts in an enterprise deal, which again goes back to the difference between enterprise and small to medium-sized business is that that rep really has to be good at calling those plays and making things happen and knowing when to pull certain people in. Um, Cause if you're not good at that skill, you're going to flop uh, from an enterprise perspective. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a one man or one woman sort of proposition to, to be able to make those, those larger, more complex sales, I imagine. Oh, no, absolutely not. Yeah. Very good. Well, before I get to my next question, just to turn to the <clears> audience <throat> real quick, just to look where, where people are joining from today. Uh, thanks for, for commenting. Those of you that did on, on where you're joining from in the world today. Uh, here's someone I think, you know, uh, James <laughs> yep. I'm going to roll off where she has the same last name as you. On the other yep. side of the wall from James in Wisconsin. So uh, thanks, Emma, for joining here today. She's been on the show as well, uh, Emma Rolla. And then um, also got uh, Tim from Connecticut. Thanks for being here today. Um, got someone from uh, Alberta, Canada, uh, Boston, Massachusetts, et cetera. So thanks for 
uh, everyone that they commented here. Um, also curious, I also asked the question, what, you know, kind of, why are you here? Are you, what are you looking to learn? Are you, are you coming at this from a sales rep perspective or from the perspective of someone who is buying or negotiating with or engaging with salespeople in your organization? Um, this is from Jeremy on LinkedIn. He says, been in many work tech enterprise sales cycles over the various years. Curious what might be new and different in the year ahead. So it sounds like uh, Jeremy's in the world of sales. And then uh, a follow-up comment to something you mentioned a moment ago, uh, James, uh, Timothy on LinkedIn says, years ago, um, a division of Gartner did a study and shared that in enterprises, once the deal size was over 50K, the number of people on the buyer side was eight people who all had to sign off before a deal was established. Have you seen that number going up or down? So I guess yeah. maybe another way to frame it is, you know, how from a buyer's perspective, you know, how how big or complex is that buying group usually for some of these larger enterprise deals that we're talking about here? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, the and there's a lot of good data on that, you know, as far as influencers versus decision makers, who's got signing power, you know, who can only say no, but you know, but can't say yes to your deal, kind of the, the typical cliche yeah. stuff you hear in sales. Um, so I think that numbers has kind of stayed the same. Um, obviously, you know, below those eight people are people that influence those people's decisions and, and the process too. Um, but that also brings up a great point with enterprise sales, and that's that a good enterprise sales rep is bringing those stakeholders in early and not waiting until you're kind of three fourths of the way through the deal and then trying to bring them in and trying to win them over. Um, yeah. so that's a big mistake I see a lot of times with sales teams is that they go after just the decision maker. And they go really, really far and the deal stalls because wait a second, there's actually five more people that need to approve this piece of technology or the process we're trying to change. Um, so trying to bring those stakeholders in at the appropriate time is a really big part of a good, successful enterprise sales strategy. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And, and kind of along those lines, leading into another question, then, you know, what, in addition to some of those tactics you just mentioned, what are some of the skills that you've seen be most effective and most successful with, with successful sales reps? Yeah. I mean, my number one skill that I always hired for was in like an entrepreneurial spirit. So someone who kind of has that like mind that they're running their own little show um, and they're able to take ownership of their entire process and build their own relationships and do their own thing. And they're not afraid to try things. They're able to take risks. Um, so they're kind of like a mini entrepreneur that's embedded within an organization. That's, that's typically the kind of skill set that I'm looking for uh, from a sales perspective. But beyond that entrepreneurial mindset, um, Again, it's cliche as true of probably any role, but like a very optimistic mindset is very important too. Um, because there's such a big roller coaster when it comes to doing enterprise sales. Because a lot of times you're talking about maybe closing three to five de deals a year. Um, and so if two of those deals don't make it or they get pushed or whatever, you're kind of down in the dumps, but you need to keep that positive attitude uh when you're going through things. And it's not so you can't ever feel bad, but um sales reps who are naysayers or whatever, they're not, they're not going to make it. So I think optimism is a big part of it too. Yeah. Um, and the last thing I want to say is probably persistence. Like you have to be very persistent um, and you can't let off the gas pedal when you're doing deals like this. So that's something that you can't have someone who waffles on, should I make an activity or not? Which kind of goes back to the entrepreneurial mindset, right? Like they're willing to take risks. They're willing to take an action and see what happens. Um, Cause you kind of need that in the sales world. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe on the flip side of that, then what other than not doing the things that you just mentioned, you know, not, not having the entrepreneurial spirit or not being persistent, are there other skills or blind spots that will undermine your ability to be successful in, in sales? Yeah. I mean, I think you get too caught up in, this is again true of probably most roles, but you get too caught up in politics and you're not, not letting things go. Um, that really can just stop your ability from from doing things. So I, I think that's a big part of it is, is that, um, again, kind of on the opposite side of things, like not willing to take risks, not willing to make that call, not willing to do something is a big part of it. Um, and then this is uh, kind of abstract, but I would say too, if you don't have the intention to actually serve your customer, you know, you see a lot of sales reps that are just trying to make the, make the sale. That works in small business or quick, quick smaller level sales but it doesn't come across in enterprise sales. If you don't actually get invested in the success of your client, it will show and it'll affect your sales figures too. So I'd say that you have to have more of that servant mindset going into it versus more of that. I'm just trying to make a quick buck. Yeah. Yeah. More of a kind of a service-based approach, you know? Yes. Yeah. And, that, and part of that, I imagine 
you know, one thing you haven't mentioned yet is, you know, really understanding and listening to what the buyer wants. I imagine that's a pretty, pretty important skill or soft intangible skill that reps need to have. Is that, would you agree with that? Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. So I think, and there's, there's been some good studies on this too. Uh, the book gap selling talks about this. I think it cites a Gartner study actually. Um, but sales reps that listen more than they talk are more successful, right? So I think the ratio is like, if they listen 60, 70% of the time on calls, and now there's like software tools that show you how often you're talking on those calls and stuff too. Uh, but if you listen more than you talk, that's a good sign. Um, and, you know, one of those traits that kind of goes into entrepreneurial is kind of that like curiosity, creativity side of things. Because uh, that was one thing with my reps, if they were able to go into a business and get really curious about how that business works and who's involved, how they started the business and why they're doing things. And basically just kind of interview that that business during those discovery calls versus simply looking like, do they have the budget? Do they have the time frame? Do they have the, kind of the band, the typical stuff, right? Like any person can, you know, ask those basic, basic questions. But if you are actually curious about how that business works and what their problem is and kind of treat yourself almost like a doctor is trying to find the root problem, that's a much more successful sales rep. So I don't know if curiosity is the right word. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't think just strictly listening is like the answer. I think it's a deeper yeah. level. It's more of a mindset thing than it is simply an activity thing. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. And really just trying to dig in and understand and ask good questions and, you know, help, help the customer, the potential customer articulate things that they may not have fully articulated yet, you know, cause you think about enterprise technologies or, any sort of solution sale, you know, a lot of times it's a solution that the client's not familiar with or experienced with. So it's your job to figure out you know, kind of what their hot buttons are, what their needs are, and really dig into it and under, understand. I think that's a, a curiosity mindset. It's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. That's something that we push hard on from our consulting perspective is making sure people are trusted advisors and educators in the sales process. Like, I guess, you know, if that was kind of some of our approach in general, it's that the best salespeople are educators and they're out there trying to teach their prospects and their customers about their products and solutions, as well as the underlying problem too. Um, because you should be that trusted expert in the area. This is kind of something when it comes to the arc of an enterprise sales rep, you really can't jump into enterprise sales right away. You kind of need to learn the industry because you need to have that knowledge so that you can ask the right questions and you can really help people undercover their problems and then teach them about those problems so that by the time it comes to actually make the sale, it's a no-brainer because they've, they've they've trusted you along that process because you've helped them understand the actual problem they're facing too. So that's a big, I think, mistake I see a lot of times with newer sales reps is they try and jump right into the big deals. But if you don't understand what you're selling and understand how it fits into your customer's life and solves the problem, you're going to really struggle with being successful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well said. And uh, here's a here's a comment from uh, Carmen on LinkedIn, which is an interesting follow up. She says uh, mindset is very important. EQ with consistent branding and outreach. Your personal brand is important. How you walk and integrity of what you say you're going to do is important. Uh, so yes. 100%. EQ, you know, EQ, how, how important is EQ to, to being a good salesperson? Uh, I, th I think it's pretty important. Um, I, would, I would actually put personal branding. And I, I kind of hate the term personal brand. I'm slowly coming around to it, but sure. I call it more of like uh, authority, right? Like, are, are you an authoritative figure? Do you have that, that trusted advisor um, reputation? Um, I almost think that's more important than EQ sometimes because People will buy from people that they trust will get the deal done. You can't have like no emotional ability. <laughs> you can't be like totally dead. And EQ is definitely a huge benefit. But I do think we will buy from people that are kind of weird or kind of awkward or have issues with, you know, the emotional side of things. Um, if they can truly solve our problems and they're really good at helping us understand our problems too, and they have a good solution for it. So I will say like, you know, that building up that personal brand just again, something that we kind of focus on and Emma's part of that, that sphere too, obviously, is as a sales rep, you should be out there educating in public and you should be out in front of people, helping them provide value at scale. Um, obviously with your customers, you're providing one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one help and one-on-one -on -one value, but a good sales rep nowadays is active on LinkedIn. They're posting content, they're doing things so that they come across as that trusted advisor, should they come across, so that people know that they are that trusted advisor in that sales process. Um, so I think that's a huge part of it. I think that yeah, Carmen makes a great point there. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. 
and, and you bring up another sort of interesting thread here with, um, you know, the authority mentioned before, um, tell us about your, your workshop a little bit, this, this coaching program you, you guys do and, and what are some of the things you, you help sales reps do that are along those lines, like in terms of creating that authority and their perceived authority and all that stuff. Yeah. So we just launched the catalyst community about two months ago, which is a online community, um, Slack channel, weekly calls, uh, weekly educational content. And really the, the goal of it is to help sales reps and small business owners build online authority, build that personal brand through usually creating content and through building their platforms. Um, so they can expand the reach and ultimately generate more revenue. Uh, but the goal is really to get people active and comfortable with being that online teacher so they can provide that value at scale that helps them build that authority. So that's really the kind of the, the gist of what we're doing from a training perspective. Yeah. And and you do that from the perspective of helping sales professionals find opportunities and leads, or is it more about reinforcing and sort of augmenting a particular sales pursuits and things of that nature, if that makes sense? No, it does. Yeah. So it's not as much like um, outreach focused, right? It's a lot more inbound focused and outbound focused uh, in the sense that you are really out there putting value out at scale, teaching people through the content that you create. I mean, you're a prime example of that, right? With all the content you produce, that you're out there providing value for free at scale. People see you, they trust you, and they reach out to you to get that help. Um, so it's kind of that inbound lead perspective. But anyone who does this will tell you that it helps active deals too. If you have a pipeline and people are connected with you on LinkedIn and they see you talking about the problem you're talking about solving, you know, in the boardroom discussions too, that helps reinforce the value you provide and helps you win more deals too. So it's not just about lead generation. It's actually about like improving close rate and kind of building trust across the entire pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. Super, super interesting. And, uh, and it's interesting to hear you say that because when you first said it, I was thinking, okay, that's a great inbound, you know, way to create, um, you know, some leads or whatever. But it, it's a really good point that it, you're also reinforcing your value and adding another layer of engagement with uh, with buyers or potential buyers that you might already be working with. That's super interesting. Oh, yeah. We're, we're talking about a 12-month sales cycle. You know, it's very, very common that your contacts will, will connect with you on LinkedIn or whatever platform you're on, subscribe to your newsletter, whatever content you're doing that you're putting out that authoritative you know, information, it's a very good chance they'll connect with you and they'll kind of get that slow drip of good value from you, even outside of your normal sales discussions and sales meetings. Yeah. Yeah. Build that trust, authority, all the things yep. I mentioned a moment ago. What do you see as the general future or prospects for the sales profession within technology and technology related services? So I think like a lot of things in the world, there's kind of becoming this split of some parts of the market are struggling and some are doing really well. Uh, so I think the kind of going off what we're just talking about the sales reps that are able to put on that teacher hat and be providing value at scale and running these large complex deals and have the ability to do so, they're going to do really well. And I can tell you, you know, from what I'm seeing, th those jobs are still in demand. Uh, companies want reps that can do that. And if you have a personal brand, like not in like the fluffy sense, but like the actual like people trust you and you are a resource, uh, you are in demand right now still. On the flip side, like many things, you know, those smaller deals or more transactional based deals, those are moving away uh, faster and faster and being replaced by automated signups or marketplaces within different uh, platforms and ecosystems. So that'd be one thing that, you know, if you are in the sales career, you should be trying to develop those skills, allow you to not even just enterprise sales, but it's more of those you know, personal value based skills um, that's going to help you stay relevant. Um, and the last thing I'd say, too, is just from a, uh, a software side of things. You know, there's some changes amiss as far as resellers and selling directly and that kind of thing. So I do think that if you are trying to sell technology, uh, trying to sell direct is a good thing too, versus trying to go through resellers, because there are some weird changes that some resellers are making and mergers and changes that will lead to a, a potential big shift in your company quickly. So that would be the other thing I would just say is just trends amongst tech is that um, those relationships are always changing between the, the implementers and the actual software providers too. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Great point. I'd be curious to hear from the audience too. Um, what do you think the most important skill set is for the, the world of sales? Um, if you don't mind dropping in the chat, I'd love to you know, see, see what uh, feedback James and I have uh, and from your feedback. Um, so what, what, uh, what skills do you think are most important for sales reps? I'd love to hear from the audience and 
while while you're commenting on that, maybe I'll shift gears a little bit here, James. And we've been talking a lot about sales professionals. If you're a if you're in a, in the sales profession and you're looking to be more effective, you know what are some tips to be more successful? But let's shift gears and talk about the other side of the table now. If you're a a CIO or a CFO or some sort of buyer within an organization that is negotiating with or interacting with sales reps from a software vendor or services company, whatever it may be. Um, what are some of the, what are some of the things to be aware of uh, if you're a buyer when you're buying from and negotiating with uh, tech sales reps? Yeah, that's a great question. You're probably good at answering this as much as I am, <laughs> but I do think uh, it's important to, really trust and understand what you're buying um, and not fall and be hoodwinked by providers and sales tactics and things. Um, I see a lot of companies that go after that shiny object when it comes to tech. Um, they focus on features and whatever you know fancy demo they're getting, but the sales rep never actually understands their business. They never actually really get to know the customer and understand what they're trying, what problem they're trying to solve. Um, so if you feel like you're being you're moving too quickly and you're being sold on something and you don't don't feel comfortable with it, stop, ask questions, understand that. Um, just from like a basic perspective, any good sales team or or provider should be able to give you really strong references. That you can talk and talk and like you know understand did they actually solve things? Um, it was it was a timeline I actually met. How was the budget? Um, so actually follow up with those references that they get you, um, so that you know that the provider you're working with. Um, has actually done these things before and, and been successful with them. Um, I see that happen often where people kind of oversell what they can do. So I would say ask for ask for referrals or references in your actual industry. People like you um, is a big part of it. Um, and then obviously some, some basic things like, you know, timeline, budget, how often are they actually met? <laughs> um, because I think that a lot of times when you see timeline, that was a, that was a big thing for me Work with my reps is that I didn't, I didn't want to lose a deal because of timeline. Obviously, no one wants to, um, but you don't want to be untruthful to your provide, you know, to your prospects, saying, "Oh, I, I can do that in six months," when really you know it's going to take nine months to do. Um, so I think having those honest discussions, and you want to find sales reps or companies, firms that are honest with you. Um, and so don't just look for the answer you want. Look for the answer that's the honest answer. So I know it was kind of hard to say that, but like it's one of those things that. Uh, sometimes what I'll run into from a sales perspective is that the buyer thinks they know what they want. And so the sales reps or vendors are talking to will try and give them the answer they want, mm -hmm. but it won't be, it won't be the truthful answer. Right. So I think kind of part of it as a buyer is having the humility of saying, okay, I'm going to find a vendor I can trust. And when they give me an answer, I'm going to have to be okay with it, even though it's not the time frame I wanted or the cost I wanted or the features I wanted. Uh, but understanding how to having that mutual trust is a really important part of a good, successful implementation of any project. Yeah. Yeah. You, you bring up some really interesting thoughts here. Kind of a follow up to it is, is if I'm a, if I'm a buyer and let's assume that I'm not dealing with um, someone with the highest IQ, EQ, I should say, yeah. um, they are not the highest level of emotional intelligence. They, they may not necessarily be fully understanding or trying to understand my needs and how my company is different or my needs are different. And um, a lot of, in our industry, it seems as though there's a, there's a sort of a movement to sell, you know, best practices or standards, you know, cookie cutter approaches that, are meant to accelerate a software deployment or make software easier to use and things that are well intentioned. But when you're selling that, sometimes you create these, uh, these false expectations or unrealistic expectations about what it really takes to go through, you know, all the changes that need to happen to deploy software. So I guess my question is, how do you, if you're a buyer, how do you see through that? Like if you get a sales rep who doesn't have the most, you know, I, I'm not going to go so far as to say they're, they're trying to hoodwink you or intentionally, yeah. trying to you, but they're selling you some sort of standard methodology, cookie cutter approach that may not fit your needs. How do you see through that? Or how do you dig into that if you're a potential buyer? Yeah, that's a really good question. Cause that's probably the most common thing that you see, right? Is that you have sales reps that get sales training on a process and you run people through it. That's what you do, right? Yeah. Um, it's like, and obviously it's sales is a profession and you wanna get good at your skills. So you read books and you get take sales training, do different things. But what that can create is kind of these robots that don't actually um, sell to the customer. They kind of just ran through a process. 
Um, obviously, having a process is a good thing and having a template is a good thing when it comes to making sure the quality is there um, and that you know, you're actually delivering correctly. Uh, but to your, to your question though, that goes, I think, back to talking to references um, and really understanding like, is what they're saying actually what happens, right? Like, or even like asking them, like, how many of your projects stay on budget? How many of your projects stay on timeline? Um, and obviously they can lie, but then you have a whole different other ethical issue when it comes to lying. Um, but I, I think really understanding how that firm works is a really important part of that process. And to me, that almost comes back to, do you trust that team that you're working with? Have you met, you know, not just the sales reps, but the people that will be managing the project for you or the people that will be consulting on the project for you and having, I guess the easiest way to kind of tell is that there's discrepancies in who's saying what when you're talking to different people when it comes to time frame and budget and, and implementation and just kind of looking for red flags. Um, and I'll, I'll say in that too, that if you see multiple red flags in the buying process, stop, take a breather, look at different options. Um, I've seen so many companies ignore red flags and then, you know, cause they, they want to get it done again on timeline or whatever it might be. And then it comes in and bites them in the butt so much harder because all of a sudden it's a two year thing because they had to start and stop and it costs twice as much. And so don't ignore those red flags when you're having those discussions, uh, because oftentimes there's something there that probably needs to be investigated. Yeah. Yeah. And along those lines too, um, you know, with, with the whole movement of a lot of these. So a lot of these legacy uh, enterprise technology vendors had on-premise solutions and they're sunsetting their, their products that the on-premise products to move customers to the cloud and what they're doing, which is an interesting sales tactic is to say, you know, we've got a deadline of support for the old legacy products and you've got until whatever year, 2027 or 2029 or whatever year the vendor has arbitrarily said, it says you need to be on these new cloud systems by this date. Are you seeing like a, it, vendor strategies like that does that undermine the trust that sales reps need to build with with buyers to be successful yeah and that, that whole process is an absolute mess to me <laughs> kind of been, you know watching that that side of things um because nine times out of ten you know the the software vendor will allow it to run longer than they say they're going to allow it to run and all of that um, but i've seen so many companies look at alternatives because they're, they're being kind of force fed these upgrades um, which like, rightly so, like if you're not, if you're not ready for it, or if you can't budget it, you know, you weren't, you weren't realizing you're going to have this major expense coming up. Um, that is a tactic that I've seen, uh, played out a lot. So I would just say kind of, again, hit that pause button. If that's the case, it doesn't mean you should leave that software vendor because they're doing that, but you know, that is something that comes up pretty often. Um, I will say though, from what I've seen, there's some great opportunities to negotiate when that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times vendors will throw these these big renewal packages at you for this upgraded solution. Um, and I would highly recommend you use that as a negotiation point saying like, we're not ready to do this. Like, can you make us ready to do this based on giving us a good offer here? Um, because a lot of times, you know, a lot of times those newer cloud-based uh, software implementations for them are a lot of times more scalable. So they can, they can offer different discounts on them and stuff too. So it'd be one thing, not every vendor, not every software company offers good discounts, but I wouldn't say that's an opportunity there as well. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do time-based sales generally work? Is that generally a good tactic to say, you know, a lot of the vendors, whether it's arbitrary deadlines to move to the cloud or even just a period end sort of incentive. Like if, if I can get this deal done by end of the quarter, end of the month, end of the week, end of the day, whatever, um, I'll give you a huge discount. Is that, is that a, an effective tactic? Cause we see it a lot. I'm just curious if you, if you think it's, it works. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting question. So I, I think it depends on what you're selling. It depends on the software, it depends on the technology. Um, it does move the needle sometimes. I think there's some cases where, you know, companies really, uh, they expect some sort of concession coming from the vendor. So uh, you, you kind of have to come forward with something. But I will say, like, I've seen a lot of sales reps kind of do like the Hail Mary approach to discounts, you know, like they probably aren't going to close that deal. So they'll throw kind of a Hail Mary like out there and say, okay, you know, maybe I'll get it done by this end of this quarter if I throw a 10% discount or a 20% discount at them. Um, and almost always that doesn't close. Like usually, usually if, 
if price isn't the issue and the issue they're not moving forward is not because of price, it's more because of timeline or other things that are happening in the business, it doesn't really make sense to throw throw discounts out at them. But on the flip side, as, as a buyer, it's always a good thing to ask for those things and see what kind of incentives you can offer. A lot of times knowing that they're probably going to come back with some sort of timer or some sort of stipulation on it, um, it's, it's still good to go through that process. Yeah. 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 Very interesting. We I had a, a client several years ago that um, it was end of year and they were they were evaluating a, a potential software solution and they had narrowed down to that one vendor that was sort of their preferred vendor, but they still hadn't gotten sort of the the CFO was still working to get sort of that internal alignment and approval to do the full implementation. Uh, but they gave them an end of year deal, like a massive discount to get the contract signed on, on New Year's Eve, the last day of the year. And uh, they signed the contract, got a huge savings, but then they never implemented the software um, because they could never get the, you know, they never got the budget, never got the support internally to actually do the project, but they bought this huge, massive, expensive ERP system. So, you know, sometimes it could backfire, but I I mean, if you know you're going to move forward and you know, you know, like you said, if time is not an issue or timing is not an issue or a concern, then sure, maybe that, that period end discount could, could be a, something that rocks it off center. Yeah, that, that's where I think kind of being a good buyer is a good thing, right? Like having people on your team that know the tactics that are used from a sales perspective like that, because you can get, I won't say tricks the right word, but it's one of those things that if you're not ready, you're not ready. Um, yeah. So, and discounts come back around. There's always another quarter that you can ask for something too. So I, I wouldn't frame it in that perspective by any means. Yeah. So I think you alluded to this a little bit earlier, but I'll, I'll ask it again and maybe we can go a little deeper here. But um, as a buyer, how do you, how do you ensure that you're, protecting your interests and, and getting the information you need from sales reps. I know you talked before about um, talking to references and doing your due diligence, but maybe we could dig into that a little bit. You know, what, what is it, if I'm a buyer, what's my responsibility to ensure that I'm not getting tricked or hoodwinked or um, maybe even unintentionally information, key information that I need to know is being left out. Maybe I have a sales rep that's not educational. They're not acting with authority and, teaching and all the stuff you talked about earlier um, on the flip side, how do I, what do I do? You know, if I'm a buyer and you know, what are my responsibilities to ensure that, that uh, you're getting complete information, protecting your own interests? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it's kind of layers to it, right? Um, I, I do think I kind of said it before, but if you, if you feel uncomfortable with how something, something's happening, that's a good chance to kind of pause mm-hmm. and talk to other vendors um, just because you have someone, just because you have a deal that's kind of progressing with one vendor or two vendors doesn't mean you can't stop for a second and talk to somebody else. Um, there is, depending on what you're buying, there's a lot of value in bringing in consultants that that do this, you know, over and over again, um, because they they are used to this process. They know all the vendors, they know all the partners, they can provide references for you. Um, so I do think, you know, if you're talking about a piece of technology that you're going to buy once every decade, it's probably worth to pay extra to have someone come in that actually knows what they're what they're buying. Um, especially if your team is not used to buying something like that. It's been a, you know, 10, 15 years since last time you've really in earnest looked at replacing a major part of your technology stack. That's probably good to bring somebody in uh, to help out with that too. Um, kind of an underrated uh, thing that you can do with some vendors and some implementers is you know, ask them if they can do some sort of paid discovery with you um, or some sort of like paid proof of concept with you. I think that's something that's really underutilized. That's like a very good investment um, of if, if you're not sure that the whole process and architecture of what they're proposing is quite right, you don't quite feel comfortable with it, you know, asking them, hey, can we do some sort of paid engagement, like a 90 day paid engagement where your team comes in, um, you know, and looks at our processes and talks about how the software is going to integrate and kind of roadmaps things that way. And nine times out of 10, they'll offer to roll that into the cost of the actual project if you move forward. But worst case scenario, you know, you pay a probably a good chunk of money, but not nearly the same as picking the wrong software, um, wrong software or, you know, the implementation services and all of that. So I think that's something that I recommend uh, people look at is you, you can't ask a vendor to do a lot of work for you before that sale happens. Um, but if you want to see what kind of value they can provide and what kind of solution they're really trying to get at, saying, is there some sort of paid engagement we can do now? And they'll be happy to hear that too, because they're that knows that it's a it's a mutual partnership, mutual relationship, um, and that you're not trying to just get free services out of them. Because on the flip side, you know, as, as a vendor, 
I've gotten free discovery roadmap things given from my competitor saying like, Hey, I want to buy this from you. Right. So um, I think a lot of, a lot of vendors are burned by giving too much information when it comes to like custom planning information, because a lot of times buyers will take that to their preferred vendor and say, here's what somebody else did for me. But if you're offering to pay for it, I think that's a really good option too. So um, that, that would probably be something I would say, you know, to cons getting an outside consultant or someone that really knows that buying process and then offering to do some sort of paid discovery or paid proof of concept is a great way to, to feel a lot more comfortable going into the process. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a interesting comment from uh, Liberty on YouTube. Liberty says there's a lot of leverage the customer does not realize when the vendor offers an upgrade to a cloud solution because the vendor is normally saving overhead. So they have an incentive to move you. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a big one. I think and what's, what's, what's so hard is, you know, it really depends on the vendor too. You know, if it's a, if it's a vendor, it's a publicly traded company, they have different motives. Um, if it's a PE owned company, they have different motives. If it's a you know privately held company that's not PE owned, they have different incentives. So um, kind of knowing your vendors and knowing their structure and their incentives um, is a good thing to, to know going into the process too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Knowing what leverage you, you do have and, and that sort of thing. That's a, that's a great point. Um, Kyler on LinkedIn likes your coffee cup, James. So I, I didn't yeah, see Yeah, thanks. It. My mom, uh, for Christmas every year, gives oh. us like these fancy little coffee cups. So that's nice. <laughs> that's what I got hand painted. Not nice. from my mother, but she buys them hand painted. Nice. <laughs> I didn't notice that. So good, uh, good eye there, Kyler. And uh, Kyler had a, a question to uh, follow up here. Um, our audience is becoming savvy with AI generated content. How important is intentional content creation for authenticity? So you know, maybe another way to frame it is, you know, how is AI affecting or is AI affecting um, sales reps and, and the ability to create that authenticity and the authority and all the stuff you've talked about so far? Yeah, that's that's a great question. That's it goes a lot to what we do from a, a sales training perspective, um, because AI is becoming a lot more prominent like from a content perspective. Um, and I think people who are used to seeing AI or, or use the tools themselves can see it on like a LinkedIn feed right away and say, okay, I recognize this pattern. And like, you know, it's got a bunch of weird emojis in it and hashtags at the bottom and whatever else. Um, but there's ways to do it where, you know, you're, you're customizing it and using the AI to brainstorm content or outline content for you and then building out yourself. Uh, but to her question, yeah, I think people are becoming more and more, um, you know, just kind of sick of seeing AI content or they're getting kind of used to seeing it. So, we are big, big proponents of video um, and short form video. Again, Eric, you're good at it. You're, we're here right now. We're talking on camera. We can't have AI. Well, we could have AI fake this probably pretty soon, but um, yeah. it's pretty hard to do that. Yeah, no one would ever know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but that, that, you know, short form video is a great thing, especially for sales reps, because you are people that are on calls all day long. You are used to answering the same questions over and over again to your prospects. You know what statements you make provide value, you know the problems really well. So again, this goes back to being a really good teacher, a really good educator, um, but there's no reason sales reps at least once a week shouldn't record a 30 second, 60 second video, answering a common question that they get from their from their prospects, uploading it to LinkedIn, having a couple paragraphs to accompany it. That's the kind of stuff that AI can't fake um, and it really helps you build up your personal authority. Yeah, 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 it's very, very true. And you know, you think about AI generated content, um, maybe just a broader pattern too, is that, you know, blogging and, and LinkedIn posts, text posts are fine, but there's something about video that people connect with more. You know, you can see the person, you get a feel for the personality, things that you wouldn't get through just posting an article or whatever may be on, online. So I think, do you, do you see that video is more effective in building connections and trust than any perfectly worried blog or you know, text that it might be created. Yeah, hundred percent. I'm, I'm sure there's good data on this too. Um, but the best thing you can hear as a sales rep who's doing some sort of digital strategy is that the first time you meet someone, they say, I feel like I already know you because yes. they, see, they see so much of your content. I'm sure you've heard it, Eric, too, from all the yeah. content you do. Yeah. Um, if you're at a networking event or with prospects and they say, I feel like I already know you, that means that like they already have that weird, you know, trust, even though it's, it's, it's kind of a strange thing because like, you don't know them. Like they're just someone who's lurking. They probably, they probably never comment. They probably never like on your on your content. Um, but that to me is a sign that a sales rep or a business owner, or whatever you are in an organization, um, that you are doing it right. If someone says that, because that means that you're coming across super authentic 
and you're providing value in the content you're creating. So that's always a really good measurement of, you know, you're doing well if you're able to get those comments made to you. Yeah. 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 It's a good litmus test for sure. And it, it tells you too, that not that the deal is done or that you've been successful in closing a deal, but it tells you you're in a good position and you're doing the right thing. You're doing a good thing to help your prospects of or your conversion rate or close rate, whatever. Um, if you, if you have that sort of connection from someone. Yeah, no, absolutely. Which is something we didn't really bring up either. You know, that, um, there's, there's cases where your product as a sales rep, your product or service is not the right fit for your customer. It's kind of like not quite, you know, it's a little adjacent, but maybe someone else is better for it. Um, and those sales reps that are more educational, consultative, they build that reputation, not only by creating content, but, but again, by also being direct with their customers too. Um, cause again, that's probably another thing I see pretty often is that you have a tech solution that could be configured to be, you know, solve the customer's problem, but kind of like half halfway do it versus, you know, a software solution that's truly the best, uh, best fit for it. And these sales reps that are successful will lose do deals and lose opportunities because they're not right fit, but be honest and refer maybe even to like a potential, you know, adjacent competitor saying like, Hey, you should really go talk to them. Like they're a better fit for you. That comes back to you in your sales career going forward. But that's one thing from a, from a buyer perspective, uh, just be aware that some sales reps might try and jam you into something that isn't the right fit. But you want to find those sales reps that are truly, you know, trusted advisors, consultants that are working on your behalf to find the right solution. And one of the telltale signs of people like that is that they're willing to do things like saying, Hey, I don't think we're the right fit for this. You know, you should talk to so-and-so instead. Um, yeah. so that, that's definitely a big part of that authenticity and building that trust too. Yeah. Yeah. And that usually comes back around. I mean, there's been times where we've done that, you know, as a company, you tell someone, Hey, this isn't a good fit and here's why here's someone that could do a better job. And they'll end up coming back to you later. A lot of times, like, Hey, you weren't a good fit that, but we remember, you know, cause it stands out when you tell someone that and when you're that honest and they'll oh, yeah. have to remember and come back to you, you know, when they do have a need that fits your, your offering. Yeah, either either that person or a lot of times within twelve months you'll get a, a message you know, connecting connecting you to someone who is the right buyer for you from that person yeah. too. So it's all it's always worth it to do that from a sales perspective. Yeah, yeah. I had I had this one client uh, that I was really disappointed to not get. You know, is is one of those you know um, one of those prospects you're, you're just enamored by. It's a big company, well known company, et cetera. And the buyer, you know, they ended up not going with with us, our firm at the time, and but he kept referring like other CIOs to us. So like he wasn't referring the one he actually chose. He was referring us to, to other, um, other companies. And then he left and went to a new company and then he hired us. So, you know, the, the, the individual buyer uh, left and, and hired us at a new company. So that stuff, you know, if you play the long game, which is hard sometimes in sales, cause you're focused on quarterly numbers and things like that. But if you do play the long game, it, usually you're going to build up a, a pretty, repeatable pipeline, you know, based on that trust and people referring other people to you and being repeat buyers and all that stuff. Yeah. Go, going back to the comment earlier about the eight different buyers, that happens often, right? That maybe, maybe one over four people, but the four sellers said no. Um, but a lot of times that does come back around to you or again, in enterprise sales, people leave companies, they change positions and all of a sudden you have a, a big fan and some new company too. So it's, it's always worth it to not be, not be salty, which goes back to like being optimistic from a sales perspective because that stuff comes back around for sure. Yeah. 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 Not be too, too down. If you, if you lose out on a sale that wasn't, wasn't a good fit. Um, well, what's, um, I guess if we're, if we're looking at, um, those that are interested in or already in sales, what are, you know, what's some closing advice that you would, you would give to, to people wanting to further their career in the sales profession? Yeah. So this is going to be the obvious answer off the gate, but, you know, do stuff like start to build up your online authority, your personal brand. Um, you know, the, the biggest recommendation I have is just pretend you're an educator in your space, right? So mm -hmm. in order to be a good educator, you have to learn yourself. So you have to dive in, you have to do things, you have to work with clients on stuff and then teach people what you learn. So teach, teach what you're seeing, um, you know, basically tell the, tell the world at large, um, the experience you're getting and help them understand your, your industry, the problems you solve and the products you have. So, um, definitely building up that personal authority online is a big thing, which again, broken record, but I did it, you do it. Like it's one of those things that it, it definitely works from a sales perspective. Um, and then 
under underrated um, or underutilized suggestion would be work for a good company. <laughs> um, yeah. I see a lot of sales reps who have a lot of potential who just sit at bad companies because you know it's it's an inertia of changing companies sometimes that that can be really rough. Um, but it is a night and day difference from a sales perspective if you work for a good company. When I say good company, I mean good sales leadership is helping to kind of mentor you and coach you and not fight against you. Um, as well as actually a good product and a good implementation too, right? Like, are they actually doing good work so that you're able to meet good clients and, you know, kind of learn how to actually sell that top tier software and top tier tech. Um, it's definitely worth to kind of work your way in there. Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't sleep on small, small companies and small implementers, um, you know, either there's, there's definitely an opportunity there, but it's look for a good high quality company that you can grow at that has good technology. Um, and then work hard. That's kind of the the path to be path to being good at sales. Yeah, yeah, very good. And then what what about those of us that might be buyers? You know, we're we're CIOs or part of projects teams that are part of a steering committee or whatever that's that's buying a, a complex enterprise solution from a sales rep. What are you know what sort of closing advice would you leave with potential buyers? Yeah, so you know, I, I go back to making sure that you really have a good relationship with that vendor, like an honest, open, authentic, trusting relationship. And if there's anything that you're seeing there that's giving you uncomfortable feelings or red flags, understanding them before moving forward. Um, because I, I think the biggest thing that I see is that companies move forward with the wrong vendor, they purchase the wrong software. And you know, whether it's because they feel rushed because of their own internal timeline or they wanted to save 15% on the total cost of the project. And then again, you see it all the time. All of a sudden, it's two years later, it's not implemented and they're paying a lot more money and it's taking a lot longer because they, they didn't trust and have, didn't have a good vendor at the beginning. So I think making sure you get it right the first time um, is a really important part of that. Another thing that from a tech perspective uh, or buying tech is understanding the platform and the roadmap in front of it. Um, I see a lot of companies that will again save money or whatever by going with a vendor, um, but it is a vendor that's kind of on its way out um, or doesn't have that long, good roadmap or doesn't integrate well with the other systems they have in place and all these different things. So um, I don't want to say don't go with you know, small, small software options, but making sure you're picking a technology stack that's going to actually be what you need for the long haul and has all the different things you need in it. Because um, again, I, this is more from a web development perspective and see people build their web applications on some sort of proprietary non-open source software that wasn't, you know, but it made sense because of this one feature they wanted, right? And all of a sudden they can't do anything with it because there's not a lot of implementers that can actually program in it or do things with it. So they're, they're kind of handcuffing themselves unnecessarily. So just kind of knowing with your eyes wide open that you are, are getting something that's actually going to solve your problems and, and be good for the long term. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good advice. And then if, if, um, for those that are in sales and want to sort of sharpen their skills in sales, how, how do they learn about your coaching program? And maybe just give us a quick summary again. I know you mentioned it early on, but for those that may have missed it. Yeah. So I appreciate that. Yeah. So our, our website is rolloffconsulting.com. Um, so check that out. And on there, you'll see the Catalyst community. And that's really our our foundational or kind of like our, our main uh, offering. And that's that's our, our group coaching um, as well as group calls, we have master sessions too. So we bring in guest speakers to talk on certain topics related to personal branding, digital sales. Uh, we actually have a speaker coming up in March um, who's going to do public speaking and kind of talking about ways to improve your speaking as a sales rep too. So um, that'd be a good thing to check out there. Otherwise, you know, following us on LinkedIn, um, I'm James Roloff, and then my wife Emma's in the business too. So we do a lot of content in there and kind of talking about the things we've been talking about today. You'll see us doing that too. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Well, good. Well, I appreciate um, appreciate you being here today and appreciate all the advice for, for both sales reps and buyers from sales reps. I think uh, hopefully you've covered uh, done a good job covering both both sides of that. So thank you for being here today, James. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. And um, you can, uh, again, this, this uh, conversation will get edited and we'll add some more content to it. It'll become part of our uh, official Transformation Ground Control podcast that gets launched every Wednesday. So a week from tomorrow, um, you'll see that episode with this interview here with James. Um, you can see current and past episodes of that podcast if you just go to transformationgroundcontrol.com. And that's an aggregated site where you can see all the different platforms where you can listen and watch and subscribe to the podcast. So be sure to check that out at transformationgroundcontrol.com. Um, we do this live podcast interview every Tuesday, same time, same place. So be sure to 
keep an eye out for future events here on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter as well. And uh, yeah, thank you for uh, being here again, James. Thank you to the audience for all the great questions here today. And uh, if you know someone that might be interested in this topic, please feel free to share it with them. We encourage you to distribute it to your team members and colleagues and friends and all that good stuff just to get the, the content out to them. So thank you everyone for being here. Hope you have a great day and we'll see you next week. Thank you.